Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our last night of National Infertility Awareness Week. Reminder, today is also the last day to enter our contest. Make sure you share the videos, and our contest is pinned to the post of our, top of our uh, Facebook page. Tonight is super fun. I'm so excited. We have uh, Meredith, who is a founding partner of Everlasting Hope. She has Midwest Surrogacy Services. You're going to learn so much from her. And then you'll also meet Kristen Natwick, who is a board member of ours. And she also has utilized surrogacy. So be prepared to learn a lot tonight. Remember also to take our one in eight pledge that we started this week. We're going to continue that fun here for weeks. You'll see more to come with that. And so without further me talking, I'm done talking. We got two cool people here I want to bring on. Kristen and Meredith. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. I am so excited for tonight. I think people are going to learn a lot, uh, whether it affects them, they need it, or they know somebody or not. I think it's just a topic that we need to get more education out there in general, too, for people. So uh, we've had some questions that kind of came through earlier on this one. So, But first of all, I want each of you to introduce yourselves. If you have a connection to infertility, which we know you do, share as much as you'd like with that, and um, we'll go from there. Meredith. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, you started to fade out a little bit. Um, my name is Meredith Fea. Um, I um, started Midwest Surrogacy. Um, I personally have never... I mean, in the past had uh, a connection to infertility. I never knew anyone. Again, a lot of people don't talk about it. So you don't know whether you know somebody or not. So I'm sure I did. Um, but I have always thought uh, surrogacy was fascinating. And um, I knew that one day after I was done having my own family and if uh, my spouse was somebody who... Um, would be on board that uh, being a gestational carrier was something that I always wanted to do. So um, I've been a carrier before and I knew that I always still wanted to be a part of that, even though at some point my body can't continue to do that. Um, and so that's how Midwest Surrogacy was born. And I absolutely love the people that I have met through it and um, the way that I feel I've been able to contribute um, to the world and to people um, to, you know, lend a helping hand or uterus or whatever else. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's great. Lend a uterus. I love that. <laughs> and Kristen, you've utilized uh, surrogacy service before. I have. Yeah. Um, uh, my husband and I, um, we tried to have a family for almost six years. And um, at the, I guess, end of our journey with um, trying myself to get pregnant, we decided to use a gestational carrier. And our carrier ended up being a good friend of mine. Um, so she was the kindest and sweetest person, or she still is, but um, she said, yeah, I'll do it for you. And our son was born in uh, 2015. So it was a crazy journey to get to that point, but we are so grateful for her um, that she was so willing to do this selfless act um, so we could um, be parents. I love that. I love how you say it's like a selfless act. That's a good way to look at it. It's a service. It's giving back in a different way. So Meredith, what made you start your agency? Um, well, I kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, just being able to um, help people. So surrogacy, I heard about it when I was in high school. And I was just like, that is fascinating. That is fascinating from a science point of view that you can take genetics from two other humans, put it in another person with no genetic uh, connection. It can grow it can come out, it doesn't look like you. And, you know, you can just give that gift to somebody like it is the I'm sorry, it's the most rewarding um, 
the most rewarding thing that I have been able to be a part of. Um, and not only just from the gestational carrier perspective, but as somebody who is able to help make those connections between two other groups of people and have them um, have that lifelong bond and connection um, is, it's amazing. I love that. And Kristen, you, you knew your surrogate, but I'm assuming you could relate to the whole lifelong bond. It's not like, here you go, bye. You know, I'm assuming these families have a connection. Oh, for sure. Um, our, uh, you know, our carrier, she lives, um, she doesn't live, I live in Bismarck and she doesn't live in Bismarck. Um, but we uh, connect, we, I mean, have been connected before this and we are still connected after. Um, you know, I'm a part of her family. I know what's happening in her life and she knows what's happening in our life. And um, yeah, it's just one of those things that we are bonded for life. And, you know, I can never ever say thank you enough for her or to her and to her family for, you know, what she did. And she's just so humble about it. She's like, oh, it's fine. It's, I'm happy to do it. Like it was just like no big thing. And I'm like, it, it was a big thing. Um, it was a big thing. So yeah, she's just a very special person. And um, yeah, she always will be. I love that. Meredith, can you run through like a general overview of what the journey through surrogacy might look like for someone when they come to you? Yeah, so definitely. Um, it always starts with that initial um, outreach and connection. Um, so typically somebody will um, reach out. Uh, there's um, like a application, not really, type thing on uh, my website, midwestsurrogacyllc.com. Um, and I'm sure you'll link that somewhere. Yes, I'll put within, in the comments. Uh, and you're in our research section too under surrogacy, yeah. but I'll also put it in the comments. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's just like, you just fill out a little bit of information, whatever, not anything too grandiose or whatever. And then we kind of make our first contact. So um, if you're local, then we used to get together uh, and have coffee or something. Um, but for anyone who's a distance away um, or currently, um, we just do like a Skype conversation, just kind of get to know each other. Like that gives you the opportunity to um, you know, find out a little bit more about the agency, you know, what we offer, what we can do for you, um, as well as it allows um, me the opportunity to kind of like, what brought you to this point? Like, you know, did you always know you couldn't have children? Have you tried for a long time and it didn't work? Have you, did you have an absolutely horrific pregnancy that almost ended in your own life? You know, all those types of different um, things where we just kind of get to know each other. Um, and then we decide whether uh, Midwest surrogacy is the right route for you. Um, and if you decide that it is, then fantastic. Um, and then, uh, so then you'd retain our services. Um, and then at that point and beforehand, some people have already um, started looking at their, um, an IVF clinic. Um, they're all over the country. There are a lot of good ones. Um, and so if you haven't already started that, I could help you try to locate the one that might be, you know, best for you and, and whatnot. Um, otherwise that's when you're meeting with them, getting your stuff figured out, um, talking to their financial counselors, cause you have to, um, all of that stuff you pay directly to them and, um, and whatnot. If there is, um, if there are embryos that you need to create, um, that's your time that you can be working on that. Um, you can, um, if you need a, a donor for egg or sperm, that's when you would get those things. Um, it's always nice. I feel personally to have your embryos ready, um, before or, or during like the carrier, um, locating and, and locking down. Um, it's just nicer when as much as done prior to that um, woman being ready to say, all right, let's go, because she's usually at the let's go when it's um, there. So as much as you can get done beforehand is fantastic, but you can also do it, do it during. 
Um, once you have all the IVF stuff done, um, then you can create your embryos. You can have them genetic tested if you want to. Um, and then that's when we start matching with the carrier. And I'm always looking for carriers and I'm always looking for intended parents and just uh, to make sure that I'm that it's not like, oh, I have one here and one here. All right, let's match them. I want to make sure that you are the right match. And uh, typically most people, and I will use our Midwestern geography, you know, geographic area. Um, everyone's kind of looking for the same thing, you know, good values, good communication. Um, something you have to think about is, do you want to transfer more than one embryo tops to, um, does she want to carry, is she okay with transferring, you know, multiple embryos? You know, all of those things kind of go into that match process as well as just, again, your morals, your beliefs, your, you know, all that, how much communication you want. All of these things are things that you're going to have to think about um, and on both parties have to. And then we have to make sure that those things mesh and um, match up. Um, once you have kind of, um, so back up one second. So as you're doing the match process, um, you know, I have the intended parents kind of write up a little bio thing, like, you know, all about us type thing with a few pictures. And then your carrier does the same thing or a potential carrier. And then I kind of show them to each other, I pass them off to um, each party. And they kind of on paper say, hey, yeah, this is somebody I would like to work with, or this is somebody that I could see working with. And then at that point, we schedule, again, depending on geographics, um, either an in-person um, little meeting um, with she and her spouse, if she has one, and then uh, the intended parents. And then I kind of um, facilitate that and everything, make sure everyone's kind of comfortable. Because it's a, you know, it can be quite daunting to have that conversation. It's like a first date, you know? Um, and uh, so if at that point, after you've met and you've talked and everything, and you feel like that's the uh, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I want to move forward, then I don't ask for any sort of an answer right then. It's like, you know, think about it, talk about it amongst yourselves for a couple of days, shoot me an email, you know, either way, let me know, type thing. And, um, and then once you are uh, matched from that perspective, then um, you typically go into like the medical and psychological um, screenings. Um, so the carrier will go to wherever your clinic is. And um, so if it's local, that's really easy. And otherwise, um, you know, they get on a plane and they go to your clinic and they follow whatever your clinic's protocol is. So most clinics generally have the same things that they um, are their requirements for a carrier and, you know, the same tests and all of that kind of stuff. But there's often like a nuance here or there. So your carrier is going to follow the, whatever your clinic's protocol is. They'll do their medical screening. There's always um, a psychological screening of some point. Sometimes it's just the carrier. Sometimes it's the carrier and their partner or spouse. Um, and the intended parents also often a, their clinic will require that as well because, you know, it's uh, it's a big deal for everyone and everyone needs to understand what they're getting into and what their expectations are. So it's never a bad idea to have an assessment and just really become clear on that. So once those two things are taken care of, your medical and your psychological um, screenings, um, then it's legal. And sometimes, or some agencies will require the legal to happen right away, but we do not because if your carrier isn't going to pass the medical screening or the psychological screening for some reason, I don't want you to have to have wasted your finances on a gestational carrier agreement and the whole legal aspect of it. So, you know, there are certain um, things that are expected for the um, uh, for their travel and all that stuff and you fund um, an account with like $5,000 or, you know, depending on where it is, you know, the, the dollar value is a little bit different. Um, but 
just to make sure that all of their compensations are taken care of for their travel and whatnot. Um, but then after uh, the medical and the psychological stuff is taken care of, then that's when you typically will do your um, gestational carrier agreement. And we can help you get, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody to help you with your legal um, lawyers that are in our area who um, specialize in surrogacy. Um, answering the question that I just saw pop in, we ourselves do not um, have a legal, um, but we recommend people and we know some very good ones um, that uh, enjoy do it and doing it and have a good track record. Um, so once the legal is done and everyone has signed off and um, your gestational carrier agreement, they call it a contract, but it's actually a gestational carrier agreement, um, is all taken care of, everyone has signed it. And then at that point, um, usually the clinic, the IVF clinic requires a copy of it. I don't know that they look at it or anything, but they need it for their file. And that is how they know that um, you are, you and your carrier are ready for um, setting up cycles and medication and getting ready for the transfer. They will not do anything until that contract is done. Um, so once that's done, um, then that is when um, uh, you will pay your agency match fee. I don't ask for it when you are initially matched um, because if something should fall through before the contract happens, like you guys don't agree on it or whatever, then you should have had to Pay that so it's not until after the gestational carrier agreement is um locked down that that's when um that is uh needed to be paid and then at that point you uh your carriers are to start her medication um and at the time of medication start that is when you are expected to fully fund um her uh escrow account which is what she will be paid out of um for the duration of the surrogacy journey um the amount that needs to go in there is variable um, depending upon, you know, is she a first time carrier? Um, is she a third time carrier? They have different amounts that their base compensation is. Um, and then also, is she carrying twins? Is it, you know, just a singleton? So all of that has different amounts. And then also, you know, her lost wages and her husband's lost wages for whatever obligations they have towards um, the uh, surrogacy and towards the baby and towards you, um, if they miss work or, um, you know, if she's not a stay at home mom or whatever, then, um, you will pay her lost wages for, you know, her obligations and stuff. So some of that stuff makes it variable. Some of it is very cut and dry, everything, you know, a dollar amount, a certain, uh, activity happened and therefore this dollar amount happens and, you know, and it's all line outlined within, your contract as well as you'll, um, you know, see some, um, you'll see kind of like an estimate beforehand. Um, so you're, you will fully fund that account and then um, she'll start her medications. And again, each clinic is a little bit different in what type of medications they um, suggest and recommend and require. And she will follow whatever protocol that is. And then, um, within that month, whatever, whenever the uh, medication start is when she will go to transfer. Um, and go to transfer just means that the embryo transfer will take place. Um, sometimes the intended parents attend, sometimes they don't. Um, it's kind of 50-50 from what I've seen. It's uh, not something per clinic. Uh, sometimes they don't require it, sometimes they do. Um, and also oftentimes the logistics of it um, play into whether the intended parents go to it. Um, then about 10 days after the transfer, she will take a blood pregnancy test um, to test her HCG levels and uh, see if it shows us uh, pregnant or not based on those values. Um, if it shows a positive of that, then a couple days later, she'll go back in and have the same test to see if they continue to go up. Um, and then at that point, they typically say, fantastic, you know, you're pregnant, she'll have ultrasounds um, to make sure there's a fetal heartbeat, but that comes a little bit later. And um, 
then you are pregnant and she is pregnant and you're all pregnant and you are um, on your way and she will follow your IVF or your IVF doctor for about eight weeks. It kind of uh, depends. And then she will just become a normal pregnant person who goes to her OB and follows the normal, you know, US protocols for maternity appointments and, and whatnot. Um, once sh uh, it's time to, um, so then again, as far as like logistics with appointments, if you are close enough to attend appointments, you can do that. Um, otherwise, if people are a fair distance away, then oftentimes I've always seen that they attend the, like that 20 week ultrasound where um, they do like the um, growth uh, ultrasound. It's the, the growth ult ultrasound as well as if you decide, you decide as the intended parents that you want to find out the gender, excuse me. Otherwise um, she doesn't find out the gender either um, unless she gets another one later and says she won't tell you, I don't know. <laughs> There's ways around that, but um, uh, yeah. So then oftentimes that's the appointment that they'll come to and then, um, you will come close to when she's due if you're local again that makes it a little bit easier to plan um and then typically she's um sometimes they'll induce at 39 weeks um other times it's 40 sometimes they don't induce at all so it all just kind of depends and you gotta uh really roll with it because babies come when babies come they don't care what your timeline is unfortunately mm -hmm. um so that's that um, going back a little bit if after your you she does those pregnancy tests and they come back as negative that the embryo did not take then at that point you have that opportunity to decide whether you want to try again um oftentimes there are embryos from um when they're created that have been frozen because they don't put, i mean if unless there's only one or two that make it um there's often um, embryos left over. And so at that point, you have the opportunity to decide whether you want to do it again. And typically, that is also within your gestational carrier agreement about how many times that um, both parties agree to try. Oftentimes, I mean, just as a rule of thumb, it's often three, that three attempts to, to make it happen. And then, and then at that point, you kind of, uh, you know, reevaluate what might be the issue, whether it's the embryos, whether it's the carrier, whether whatever it is. But um, so then you have the opportunity to um, start over and you start over at the medication point where she starts her medication and then goes to transfer again. Wow, that was long winded. <laughs> oh, that was excellent. That was like, I, yeah, learned so much. And I had known Kristen when she was going through hers. I feel like I learned a whole nother side of it right there. <laughs> So long, did your clinic long require, yeah, did your clinic require like the uh, psychological evaluation for just the surrogate and you, or you guys too? I, do, I don't remember for us, but I know for the surrogate and her husband, yes, okay. they did require that. So um, she had to, she and her husband, we, because um, our clinic was out of state. And so we flew them down to our clinic where she had to have like a medical workup. And then part of that workup was the psychological evaluation. So, yes. Okay. There is some questions. Um, what's see the average them. time frame? Yeah, if you can see them, you can average time frame from initial appointment until end. If all goes, which it will, we'll be positive. It's going as planned. Right. Everything's going to go perfect. Um, yeah. yeah we'll so, I would. Um, but also when I give numbers, I tend to be real, um, uh, make them draw out. Um, so best case scenario, very, very best, um, 15 months. Um, and, and some of that is, uh, you, we cannot be all ready to go contracts done all that stuff. And for your, or not, I guess it would be that for your, the clinic is sometimes the, thing you're waiting on because they have backlogs. So 
their initial appointment. You can wait a month to get in just to even do that. And then when it comes to scheduling the transfer after everything is there and, and ready can be a month and a half, you know? So um, best case scenario, I'm going to say 15 months um, worst case. And that's that there's not a, you know, a carrier um, that meets your expectation or not expectations, your criteria, we'll say, um, can be, you know, that can draw out and that can be, you know, a, you know, six month wait, um, too. It all, you know, just depends on, um, who it, who wants to do it and who's, um, applied. And, and I should also state that, um, you know, it's like one in nine, uh, women who, uh, do the initial um like application to become a carrier who actually do um it's it's stringent what they have to be able to um you know pass on and um you know there's there's a lot of requirements that they have to meet so um which is good mm -hmm. because you're going to get the best you know the best of what's out there um but it it really shrinks the pool from who wants to do it versus who is able to do it. What was your time frame, Kristen? I believe you had the embryos already, correct? Yeah, we had embryos created. So that piece of it was done. Um, I think I'm trying to, we started legal, um, like all the paperwork and the contract. I think that was in like August, September. And then, by the time, um, let's see, our transfer then was in end of February. So by the time we got legal done, I would say like August, September, and then working around, you know, our schedules, working around her and her husband's schedules, work, you know, trying to find a time, and then also our clinic's schedule as well. Like uh, Meredith said, you can't just say, okay, we're ready next week. Like. Mm -hmm you have to fit in with their appointment schedules. So um, yeah, I would say September, October, and it was end of March when we did, or end of, no, end of February when we did the transfer. So a couple months. Meredith, do you have a lot of intended parents waiting for carriers? Um, right now I have one. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty good. Um, and I have uh, a carrier too that's in the screening process and that's, you know, that can be kind of quick and it can take a long, you know, and it can extend out. It all um, it depends on a number of factors, um, but the main one being, you know, how quickly they are um, providing the stuff that they need to, because they need to provide their medical records for their, um, pregnancies, their pregnancies and their deliveries. So, um, and that sometimes you're waiting on, you know, a uh, release of information and the records to even, uh, be sent out and whatnot. Um, so that takes a while, you know, there's a lot of paperwork they have to do. Um, I run a background check on them. I have somebody who does that. Um, so there's, you know, a number of things that, um, that have to take place, um, and then, you know, with it all, like I, I review their medical records and I feel like I have a pretty good um, eye to be able to see something that's like grossly standing out at me as like, ooh, I don't know about that um, in their medical records. But ultimately, um, the medical records go to the IVF clinic and they are the ones who have the final say in it. Um, so I can screen somebody and say, I feel like they are a good, uh, you know, a good candidate that everything should work out. And, um, but I can't say with a hundred percent accuracy that that's the case because I don't do all the blood work beforehand that happens at your clinic and your clinic reviews those medical records to see if there's anything, um, that kind of stands out. And sometimes they can say, Oh, that's not a big deal. And other times I'll be like, mm, Nope, that is a red line, you know? Um, but it helps up front that that um, we have them within their application process of providing their medical records. Um, they also have to have um, a letter from their OB saying that they approve of them 
being a gestational carrier that they feel like they'd make a good candidate for it. Um, and the only expense that they have is that they have to have a pap within the last year um, and clinics require that. So I have them do that as part of their application process as part of their, you know, checking the boxes to make sure that they are ready to go. Um, and that's something that they will have to pay for is their, um, their uh, testing for that. So um, insurance helps cover that as like a routine thing. Um, yes, I mean, it depends on your insurance. I know a lot of them do because they uh, consider it preventative and a lot of insurances cover preventative. So you're, you're really physical. It's, you know, I mean, I know my insurance is covered as something, but I mean, some insurances don't. Um, and typically, uh, PAP is something that they say if you're under 40 or 45, I don't know what it is, that um, you only need it like once every five years. I mean, I get it every time I go in, but... I'm kind of a different can different person. So. Um, but yeah, so all of that stuff is taken care of beforehand. So if you're waiting for a carrier um, and she's got to do all of that beforehand, that can make things, um, you know, drag out a little bit. Um, but yeah, so worst case, I would say, um, we'll say two years. Now, if there's people who are thinking, hmm, I, it, you know, what's it like to be a carrier? What are just a couple things you hit on most of these? What are some other things that a potential carrier that you kind of screen for or look for? You talked about medical. Um, does their health? I mean, like, what what are some other specifics that you kind of look at? Okay, so um, if the so one of the things that um, is a definite benefit to an intended parent is if your carrier has health insurance that covers surrogate pregnancy. Those are your words, surrogate pregnancy, not surrogate parenting, surrogate pregnancy. Write um, that down everyone, write it down and go look. <laughs> that's important. Um, and that's another thing that we'll do if we don't know whether they um, have it. Um, I, um, I have them provide me with all of their um, insurance information and uh, we do a uh, thorough analysis of it. And um, there's also though, um, so I'll go back and answer your question. Your question was, what are some of the <laughs> things that um, people are looking for? So if their insurance covers it, then that's fantastic because you just pay their premiums and they're, you know, they, you pay the, for their insurance that they currently have. You just pay them, pay for it. And um, that saves you a lot um, in the end. Um, there are that, uh, a couple of insurances that when it's open enrollment, um, so again, you're waiting till the end of the year, you, like if everything lines up perfect, great, you know, um, but otherwise you have to be, you have to work with timelines. Um, there are a couple of insurances local that um, she can apply for um, that cover it. So it's, you know, uh, I think it's called the individual market. I can't remember what that term is. Um, but there's insurances that do cover it. And that's something, a huge bonus from previous years where it was like, if she doesn't have it through an employer, then you're forking out an additional 25 to 30 grand just for a policy. And you're still paying the deductibles and you're still paying the premiums. And it's just, I mean, it, it's ludicrous. But mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely something that parents want. But again, the more filters you put on your search, the smaller your pool is of search results. So um, the more criteria that you require of her, then, you know, everyone wants that. So not everyone has it. Um, but um, let's see other things that are required. So that's not a requirement of a carrier. Um, that's just a bonus if she has it. Um, I have a little list here. Um, and they're also listed out on my website. So, um, you know, pretty much everything that I'm talking about, you can also refer back and check it out um, on there. But some of the, I won't list them all, but things um, you have to have had delivered a child, at least one child of your own and be raising it. Um, you have to have uncomplicated obstetric history and uh, be able to provide those records. 
Um, you must be a non-smoker living in a non-smoker smoking home. No history of drug, of, oh, drug or alcohol abuse. Um, live a healthy lifestyle. But everyone should do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Big one, but you wouldn't even think about it. No fear of needles or shots or anything because um, they're coming at you. <laughs> for one that I've ever known, you have to administer injections to yourself um, throughout the, you know, even into pregnancy. So you'll do it for an extended period of time. So if you've got a problem with needles, mm, Maybe not, maybe not a great idea for you. Um, not take any medications that would be harmful to, harmful to a pregnancy, including uh, psychotropics, no criminal convictions. Um, again, there is a background check done, so it will be found. <laughs> no. I'm just playing. I mean, I do do it, so I mean, it's gonna happen. Um, not have received psychiatric care for mental illness, be, be between the ages of 21 and 40. Um, most clinics will go up to 40, uh, some say like 38. Um, as a rule of thumb, they typically say a BMI between 18 and 30, um, reside in a surrogate friendly state. Um, and we can help you determine that. Minnesota is surrogate friendly. North Dakota is surrogate friendly. South Dakota? Not anymore. Um, and then many other states are. Uh, New York just became a surrogate friendly state. They just had a law pass. Um, but a lot of them are, there are you know a handful that aren't and some of them have very uh, gray. They're gray as far as whether um, your uh, agreement would be upheld in court or not. Um, but we can look at all of that. Um, let's see what else. Um, do you work with um, only certain clinics or do you work with all clinics? Um, I do not have any uh, specific clinic that I only work with. Um, whoever or whomever your um, IVF clinic is, then um, I will work with them. I've worked with clinics in California, Colorado, uh, New Jersey, um, North Dakota, um, and Belgium, but that was a wow. one on there. But, um, so yes, uh, clinics all over the country and many very good ones. Um, when you also do you work with carriers only from specific states or is that all over too? So as far as carriers go, again, it's gonna, if they, they will immediately, um, be rejected if they don't live in a surrogate friendly state. So right away, um, because they have to give birth in a surrogate friendly state. Otherwise there are so many legal issues that uh, come into play. Um, so if they are um, living in a non-surrogate friendly state, then they can't. Okay. Is it rare to find a match in North Dakota for intended surrogate? Based on where we live, no, it's not uncommon. Um, I've seen it three times in the last two years. So, um, and and most parties like that, uh, that everything is kind of real, uh, really local and they get to have that um, real, like that intimate relationship where they, you know, can go out for dinner if they want to, or, you know, they can go to their appointments and they can really establish that relationship on a, you know, a little bit of a deeper level than when it's all through Skype or, um, you know, distance. I mean, even though there's so much technology now that it really doesn't matter. Um, but, but yes, to answer your questions, it's, um, not rare. I think your costs are listed on your website, correct? For the most part, there's a yes, all of, yeah, they're all there, and uh, my re my website just got uh, got revamped, so um, it's a lot more detailed even now. So, you know, it lists the different, um, you know, what you your expectation is kind of as far as uh, compensating your carrier for the different things. Um, it breaks down um, agency fees um, based on your specific situation. Um, 
with your domestic international um, first time uh, repeat. Um, and then it uh, says what your estimates are for um, legal. Um, you're expected to pay for your legal as well as your carrier's legal. They just have um, their own representation. Um, and then it has an, kind of an estimate of uh, clinic, IVF uh, clinic fees. But again, those are, um, those are done outside of um, Midwest surrogacy. You pay that all directly. They give you your financial statement of what um, you have to fund the, uh, your accounts with and stuff for them. And that money is all pulled straight from them. Okay. Is it rare to find a surrogate for twins? 50-50, I'll say that. Um, Was yours all about it, Kristen? <laughs> pardon me? Was yours all about twins if you wanted? Yeah, we actually did a transfer to embryos um, and only one took. So she was on board for twins and initially she was disappointed it wasn't twins. Um, you know, <laughs> really ready. yeah. And I mean, obviously we just wanted a healthy baby. Um, but yeah, I mean, she was on board. You know what? I find that to um, be uh, the case that because they've, I mean, they've had to get themselves mentally ready for twins. So they're, they're ready for it. And then it's not. So um, they're like, dang, you know, like I, I was yeah. ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I'm yeah. not I'm she, disappointed because now it's just going to be a little bit easier than. Yeah. Than yeah. She, kind of, she like felt bad about it. And I'm like, don't feel bad about it. We're just, <laughs> we're just thrilled. Yeah. Uh, that is one. Right. Kristen, can you walk us through a little bit? Did you go to appointments? What did that look like? I know you didn't live in the same city, but you were in the same state at least. Yeah. So we, um, we went to a few appointments. We went to the 20 week appointment, like Meredith talked about. And then we also went to, Oh, I think she had like a, a 36 week type of appointment. I don't know. It was an appointment where we got to see the baby in that 40, you know, where they take like the 40 oh, pictures. Yeah. Um, and that was really cool. Um, Cause I mean, it, it was very near the end. So it looked like a real baby um, or he looked like a real baby. Yeah, they looked like they had just have that like. Yeah, it was crazy. So, um, so, weird so, we, so we did that, but I mean, she had appointments in between there, but we didn't attend those because you know, she was two and a half hours away and she would just call or text after and just to let us know how it went. Did you communicate obviously about the appointments, but did you ever communicate like about anything else during that time while she was pregnant? You knew her, so it's probably a little different. Yeah, I think my situation is a little unique um, because I knew her personally as a friend. Um, you know, so there wasn't a whole lot of things that I felt I needed to communicate with her about where I feel like if you are um, being matched with Meredith, I mean, you're going to have to um, communicate about things um, that you might not think about, but that are important to you. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think not. I mean, she and I, like I said, we knew each other well, so I wasn't concerned about things, you know, like what is she eating? Um, is she working out or things like that? Whereas I think um, it's important again to really communicate, like if you're working with Meredith about what you're looking for and what's important to you and your family in the carrier. So you lived in Bismarck, she was in Fargo. She goes into labor or was it planned? How did you plan that one out? Well, we knew um, that she was probably going to have to have um, a C-section, actually. So we had that scheduled. So he was born at 39 weeks. So we, um, that one of the last appointments she had, he was, the OB was like, all right, well, this puts us out at 40 weeks. And it was right around Thanksgiving. And he's like, oh, let's not do that at Thanksgiving. So we just went the week before and um so yeah so he was born at 39 weeks and 
we were lucky enough we had it scheduled so we were able to be there and um you know not have to worry about missing the birth obviously you weren't in the or with her but like how soon after i was you yeah were you? I was say, oh. as soon as we met you yeah got that maybe <laughs> yeah um i was in the or unfortunately oh. my husband he was not able to be in the or because you can only have one person <laughs> um, in there. um but it was like such a surreal experience it's it was crazy i i've never had like surgery really i mean i've had surgery before when i had to do like an egg retrieval but you know, it was just different being on the other side, obviously, of it. And um, yeah, I was there and our anesthesiologist um, was just a gem. And she's like, give me your cell phone. I was like, OK. And so she literally snapped pictures through the entire process, some very graphic pictures of <laughs> um, him being born. So um, yeah, I, I got to be in there and I got to hear him and see him. And um, yeah, it was. It was wild, and then they yeah, they clean them up, wrap them up, and do all the things. And then I am walking down the hallway with my baby, and I go show my husband like here's our baby. So <laughs> kind of crazy. Did you guys get your own room then, separate from her? Did you have to like be in the room with her for recovery, or how was that? No, they were really good to us. Um, they got us our own room, um, so we, it was a like a smaller room but um we were able to have our own room and she was just down the hall from us so obviously you know we took the baby in there and visited her and visited with her family and um so yeah we were lucky enough that we got a room because i know that's not always um the case depending on where you're at and how busy they are on the floor so yeah that's awesome our, our fargo hospitals are they love surrogacies so they they think they they treat them very special um yeah. which I think is fantastic um yeah. and i mean obviously but uh they will try they try to go above and beyond you know for making sure that they're you know you each get your own room and that kind of thing but census will dictate who gets a room and right it's going to be the one who had a baby so yes, of course. Yes, yeah. They end they up were, having to hang in the carrier's room. Right. Not ideal, but it happens and everyone gets through, you know, gets by and, you know, and whatnot. But um, the, our local hospitals are amazing. Yeah. Everybody we worked with um, from our OB and his nurses. And then um, when she delivered um, at Stanford in Fargo, they were top notch and fantastic and overjoyed for us. And we're very supportive of the situation. Mm -hmm. I think that's nice for people to hear. Cause that's always, I, I, I would assume an unknown or a, you know, what will that look like? You know, we've made it through the first half. What does the second half kind of look like with that? Excellent. Is there anything else you guys wanted to add? Or if there's any more questions, you can always reach out to Meredith. I know Kristen's super open and she's passionate about helping people too. So you can always reach out to her on the side. Um, we try to touch on surrogacy at all times and have resources available for that too. Yeah, it's just, you know, I just, it's, it was just such a gift. And I know Meredith has been on both sides of it, where she's helping match and she was a carrier herself. Um, and we, like I said, are just forever grateful for our carrier and that there is the science out there that this could happen and that we could be parents. So um, it was a long, <laughs> it was a long way to get there, but um, obviously in the end, it was so worth it. Yes. And I agree with that. It's like, you've, you've waited so long and you've been through so much and you, you hate to have the why me why me why is why is this happening to me and then you know after you get that child and you look at it and you finally get to touch it like it's a tangible thing and then you're like this was supposed to be my journey like this was my path yeah so i was and, supposed to become a parent yeah and i just i have met i don't know i've met so many people um because of this journey, I've made such great friendships and there's been many 
doors open to me that I don't think would have been. So like Meredith said, it's just, it's part of my journey and it's part of who I am and I am passionate. Um, so if anybody has questions that is afraid to ask on this, you know, on the chat, um, you can reach out to me. I'm an open book. Um, I would love to help you and answer anything you might be wondering about. Yeah, I second that. <laughs> yeah, and like, yeah, we know that not, the comments might not be for everybody, especially. So right. yeah, feel free to reach yeah. out individually, or if you send them to us, we will forward them on to you guys as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for all your support for Everlasting Hope to each of you too. You've been huge assets to us, and we're so thankful to have you. Thank, thank you, you for joining. Thanks Make for sure, us. yeah, thanks. Make sure you guys, um, if you're watching, share. Today's the last day of our contest, and we will announce the winner tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.